All right, um, I'm Bill Freeman, N4NJJ, not to confuse with N2NJJ. I typically run five watts, not one watt. And uh, I'm an assistant scoutmaster, Boy Scout Troop 85, and um, I've been a member of the club for a while. So tonight we're going to talk about amateur radio and youth, the uh, do's, do nots, and uh, how to be safe about it. Um, and as Bob pointed out, that's uh, our illustrious uh, Membership Chairman Phil in the picture, along with our Treasurer uh, Chuck. Don't ask me for their calls. All right, um, okay. youth and radio. How many people are in most ham radio clubs? How many people in them are typically under 30? Our club's a little bit different, but there's not many clubs have a very a fairly young membership. Lancaster club's a little bit different. Um, how many people do you hear under 18 on the air at least once a week? Not, not often, right. And, how, and I, this one, how many people in here have ever tried to be an Elmer for someone? Not, it doesn't have to be a youth, it can be a senior, whoever. Anybody ever been an Elmer? All right, Jim? Anybody else help teach anybody about ham radio? We Elmer each other a lot in this club. Right. This, is, this club helps out each other a lot, and we also yeah. help out um, people that aren't hams as well. So that we're different. This presentation is designed for general kind of club thing, it's not necessarily for the Lancaster, because we're a little bit different. Um, so, the hobby constantly needs new people, because it's an old man's hobby, to be quite frank. There's constant turnover of membership, you know. Speak for yourself, man. Yeah, I know. Well, relative to Bill, we're all old. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, generally speaking, most of the amateur radio operators are generally over 50, and are either retired or working on getting close to retiring. So there's a turnover of ham membership. Also, another thing that happens, how many people are out there that are kind of like me? You'll hear me on the air for a lot for like two months, and then I'll disappear for three months. I'm looking forward to that. Right. <laughs> but there's hams out there that are like me that you'll hear, and then, oh good, he's gone. And I'm gone for a couple weeks, and then I'll be back, and then you're like, oh shoot, turn it off again. But, so that's another reason why you need to get new people in the ham radio. Um, I can pick on Steve. Steve joined the club in 2007. It wasn't really new to radio. He's new to, the, new to the club, though. But Steve was an investment in our future as a club because when Steve joined, Steve just didn't pay his 30 bucks and then you never saw him again because there's a lot of people that do do that. Steve, you know, got active. He helped out with uh, Torta or uh, Ride for Roswell. He's vice president. He does a lot of stuff. I mean, everybody in here does stuff for the club. So it's an investment to get new people into the hobby is also an investment for the hobby's future and for a club in general, it's their future. Um, ham radio, especially in western New York it seems, there's this real um, big problem, the tragedy of the commons. Anybody here know what the tragedy of the commons is? Economics term. Okay, it comes from the middle, middle ages back when the commons or the green within the village, everybody would let their cattle or sheep or whatever all graze on the village green, the commons. And what would happen is they weren't controlling how much their animals would eat. So, say, everybody in here had two, uh, I don't know, what eats grass? Um, cows. Goats or cows or whatever. Everybody had two cows and then all the grass was eaten up. So what happens to the cows? They die. And then, you know, you lose your source of milk, you lose food, all that kind of stuff. So... But you get steak. What? But you get steak. Well, you get steak, but then the steak's gone after it's, after it's dead. <laughs> it's a one-time wonder, you know? So that's the tragedy of the commons. And uh, ham radio, especially in, it seems like, in uh, the north towns in western New York, you have um, a bunch of different clubs that are all are encroaching upon each other. When you think about it, there's, you know, two clubs in Tonawanda, Lancaster kind of shares with some of the other clubs. And so the market share, to use another economics term, or a business term, is um, pretty tough because there's people all from all over and there's so many clubs. So you got to have the program that brings people in, which as a club we do pretty well with that. So why do young people get involved? It's the age old question. So the main factors are all up there. There's cost, um, you know, friends, too much work, housing restrictions, and then the old man mantra of kids these days. Um, <laughs> You know, to get into ham radio, I mean, I don't know, anybody get into ham radio for less than like 300 bucks? <laughs> exactly. So how many young people you know have 300 bucks lying around? 
So cost is, cost is a big factor, and I always laugh at people that tell the new hams, well, just get an HT. But how many people in here can hit more than two or three repeaters with their HT from, like, their bedroom or their house? Anybody hit more than two or three? Okay. Because when you, I know at my place, if I just would have started off with an HT, I probably would have gotten out of it real quick, because there's people out there, especially new hams, that if you're not getting into the repeater full quieting, you're not hearing full quieting, well, then I'm not getting in, and they go away. And then you never hear them again. So that's why, you know, necessarily, necessarily, it might be the cheapest way to go, it might not be the best way. Uh, CB, back in CB, everybody's friends was on CB. I mean, I wasn't a CB or never was, I might act like one, but I never was. Um, <laughs> so, but everybody was on CB back in the day because their friends were on there. It's like cell phones nowadays, which touches on that. There's not much difference when you really get down to it between a cell phone and ham radio. Other than the frequencies are different, but heck, you know, we can go up into the gigahertz and stuff too. We do texting, you know, who here does ready? Anybody do ready? You do ready, that's basically texting. You can do full duplex if you really wanted to, until you get in trouble. But. And then you get that old mantra of kids these days, you know. Uh, youth don't get involved in stuff if they're feeling that uh, negative energy towards them. So, especially youth nowadays, because it's not like the old days where kids are forced to do stuff nowadays, you can't really break out the uh, ruler anymore. So that, and so next thing is, how do you involve youth? Which, as a club we do, we've done a couple of youth events since I've been a member. Um, we've done a lot of stuff with Boy Scouts. We've done a Radio Merit Badge class, and we've also done uh, the Fort Niagara when uh, scouting turned 100 in 2007. A bunch of us, uh, Don, Steve, we all uh, trekked up to Fort Niagara for the weekend to um, set up the station because the council had this big uh, jamboree thing. So now we got to define youth by radio standards. I just asked everybody to look, uh, look left and then look right. So you see that most people in here, aside from Phil and a couple others, are generally middle-aged, hardworking, and we all have this desire to talk to somebody else and also we all have general technical knowledge, though know, some of us might lose it after we take our test. So really, youth is anyone who, hey, this thing. Youth is anyone landing on the left side of the bell curve. Yeah, really. Hey, Phil. On the left side. All right, so let's creatively assign age group. So I'm going to ask, who here got their license before they were 12? Anybody here pull that feed off? Okay, anybody get their license during their teenage years? All right, so three of us. Anybody who's in college, anybody in college get their license? Well, I was back in college. No. <laughs> I don't know. Anybody, was anybody a young adult, you know, age 20, you know, right after college into their, like, 30s? All right, so then a lot of people did that. So, or a lot more. And then I guess the rest of you guys got it later on, retirement, maybe? You need a license for this stuff? Regardless <laughs> 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 of what you might hear on two meters, yes. <laughs> All right, so that leads us to the next question of what programs are available, what programs are out there. Um, Boy Scouts of America has the Radio Merit Badge. It also has a Jamboree on the Air, which is a club we're going to do this October. Girl Scouts is working on something, but don't hold your breath. And then um, a program that your club develops. But why waste your time developing a program when the Boy Scout Merit Badge can do it for you? Now, I'm not here to uh, hustle Boy Scouts or anything, even though I'm wearing the uniform. But Boy Scouts is, um, the Merit, Radio Merit Badge is by far the best and most uh, comprehensive program out there for youth, regardless if they're boy or a girl. I mean, boys are, Boy Scouts like to work for this little piece of fabric, I don't know. Um, and then also it works for people that are 11, year old, 11 years old and it also works for people that are in their 30s, 40s, 50s that you might be trying to recruit to ham radio. Anybody in here ever get the radio merit badge? Anybody, was anybody in here ever a Boy Scout? Alright, so now I don't feel stupid about <laughs> <laughs> So, did you guys ever get the radio merit badge? No, but I taught it. Alright, you taught it. So. <laughs> And it was, um, it's from the 1920s, so it's an old bed. It's not anything uh, new. All right. Well, some of you will be able to read this. Most, the rest of us are too old. <laughs> <laughs> Break out the 
reading glasses. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it up for about 15, 20 seconds so everybody can just get a skim the requirements. And when you look at it, just look at uh, how diverse the requirements are. You can get some technical stuff in there, some rural stuff. It's like taking your tech test. But there's a lot that you, you don't have to know. That's that's really the thing. I mean, I was trying. Someone when I was teaching the Boy Scout Merit Badge, everybody said, "Oh yeah, we want to get a ham radio license." So I said, "Okay, I'll teach a license for the tech." But every one of them dropped out. So right, there's a lot through the third chapter. Right, because it's it's comprehensive in the sense that it's a good. Um, I think what I used was uh, Witzman sampler of radio. It has a little bit of everything, but it's not um, to the point that's going to scare someone away. Because like if you throw them the extra book, you throw them the tech book, even it's going to scare people away. I mean, it, it's kept me took me a year to get through all that. So, um, so uh, there's some more stuff you have to do: block diagram, radio, or a schematic diagram. Um, you know, how many people? I mean, it's don't have to raise your hand, but I mean, some of this stuff. I know if you had they asked me to draw eight schematics, I probably could do a resistor, and that's then I'd have to look it up. So, no, you have to actually draw eight schematic symbols or schematic symbols. Oh, we draw all that. Just yeah. symbols like capacitor, capacitor, yeah. resistor, and, and potentiometer. And now I don't even Crystal, think I can name antenna, ground, speaker, uh, diodes, uh, uh, SCR, transformer. <laughs> right, right. But you got to be able to draw those and say what they do. Right. So it's easy for us because we're hams, or some of us because we're good hams. But other, others, it, it's, it's a little bit difficult. Right. Um, another interesting thing to note: Boy Scouts has changed a lot of their merit badge that they call the hobby merit badges, like um, uh, fishing and stuff. As in, you have to find three career opportunities in radio. So we'll touch on that in a sec. But Boy Scouts is trying to get a little bit more towards um, steering people career-based, trying to give it the 20th, 21st century. So. Um, now, for there's this part of the merit badge where you can either do broadcast, visit a broadcast station, talk about broadcast radio, you can talk about shortwave radio, or you can talk about ham radio. But since we're a ham radio club, we'll stick with ham radio. I'm sure there's some broadcast engineers in here, or shortwave listeners. But for just a general sense of amateur radio, you have to say why the amateur radio, the FCC has the ham radio service, which is part of the tech test. Proper call signs, which is part of the uh, tech test. Um, carry on a 10 minutes uh, real QSO or a simulated one. You know, um, I know when we taught the, was, when we taught the radio merit badge about six years ago, it was Jim Glor, Joe Gerhardt, and myself. We ran into the problem. The boys got through everything except the HF was dead because the bands were dead that day. And there's nobody on two meters. So all these guys were there, they did all the hard work, but because there's no one to talk to, they didn't get their badge, which was kind of a bummer. It was really embarrassing, and I remember Joe was kind of aggravated. Um, so that's that's one of the harder parts of the merit badge, to be honest, is just getting a 10 minute QSO in. Well, it says or simulated. Right? Or simulated, but we, the merit badge council that we had then wouldn't go with the simulated thing. It was oh, an old almost. stickler kind of guy. So, whatever. Um, so they have to explain the difference between tech general. I mean, it's pretty basic stuff, but it covers a lot, and it's also, as, as Jim said, it doesn't get real into the nitty-gritty technical stuff. So it's not necessarily going to get you your tech license, but it's a good foot in the door. And if we had the new Lancaster Town Supervisor out, it would be great to have a couple stations set up, you know, showing out. You know, you, that's what field day is about. You're supposed to bring people from the community to your field day site. So what are you going to do with the merit badge? You're going to teach the radio merit badge, you're going to use it for a community night, have an open house at the clubhouse, there's no reason why we can't. You invite the local politicians, you know, all the way up to the congressional level, bureaucrats, general public, just put a newspaper thing up. Field day is a great opportunity to do this because, you know, we're already out there, we're already set up, people are going to be there, it's not like a big deal. Um, you know, you do jamboree on the air, any of the contests that we do would be a great opportunity to bring people out. Um, just a little blurb on becoming a Boy Scout counselor. It's it's not that hard to do. You just go to the uh, council office on Genesee Street over by the cemetery and uh, WECK radio. They uh, you just fill out the form. It's not hard. I mean, the only thing that they'll really turn you away with is, is if you have a felony conviction. So, for obvious reasons. 
So um, now, how do you get people that are slightly older, like uh, college age youth, involved? That's um, another. That's where you're going to get people that might be able, to, who might actually stick with ham radio, because oftentimes you hear these high school. I know there's a high school down it's like Springville or something that there's a ham down there that teaches in the school and also teaches the merit badge or not the, the tech a tech course. But you get the kids either drop out because it's too hard, or they get on the air and then you never hear them again. So a lot of the problem was they got on the Delavan machine and a certain ham would yell at them. Um, so what do you do? You set up. There's no reason why, as you know, as a club, we can't go to Canisius and we can't go to uh, UB on a Saturday afternoon or any of the other schools in the area and set up a station, throw up a, a buddy pole, throw up a die pole, and uh, show off the hobby. All you got to do, I mean, to set up a table, a tent, and a radio, and you're going to be sitting around shooting the breeze, and hopefully some people mill over. Um, it's really, really important at uh, at um, if you get the college people in, that you emphasize there's a lot of networking opportunities and it's very good for resume. Because you think about what college kids are worried about other than the parties and, and girls or boys or whatever, it's um, the getting a job. Which ham radio leads to careers. As you know, that's what Boy Scouts was trying to point, you know, name three careers, which you know, you can be everything from a, a broadcast engineer, you know, a dispatcher, any kind of I mean really electrical engineer, you know, you name it. Ham radio has a lot of careers that tie in. I mean, even if you wanted to go and say the ARRL is a career, you know, fundraising for non for profits and stuff. So you emphasize the networking and mentoring opportunities. I mean, I'm sure there's some engineer, some engineers in here who probably would have liked to have had someone who could have helped them out with their tests, you know, electrical engineering, whatever. Um, so yeah, ham radio. If you presented to a liberal arts school versus an engineering school, I could see the, you know, if you set this up at UB and you get all the engineering students there, what would you do with more of a liberal arts institution? What's the attraction for that? All right, well, with the liberal arts, I, I mean, I've gone liberal arts education just because I'm a music major. Um, so last year, actually, I had my 2000 set up and I set it up outside. Well, I set it up inside the room, but there were a bunch of people that came around. And I just had a uh, G5 RV, one of the mini ones that's probably as long as these three tables together. And I only had it up off the ground about this high, because that's as high as I could reach, you know, into a tree. And with that, I was pulling in Italy, Verona, Italy. I was pulling in N2N JJ, running a watt on, on uh, 75 meters. I mean, I was pulling all sorts of stuff in. And what actually got the kids interested in the liberal arts school wasn't really, oh, cool that he's talking to Italy, because, you know, who cares? You can do that on Facebook or a cell phone anyways. But it was the fact that I just had this radio, which I didn't tell them the price, but you know, I just had the radio, which it does a, which it looks it looks pretty intense at first, but once you actually start looking at the menus, I mean it doesn't compare to like an iPhone operating system. But what was really impressive to them was the fact that I just had this little antenna up only this high and it looked like a coat hanger, and that's all I was talking to Italy on. That's what was impressive to them. There wasn't any servers, there wasn't any cell phone tower. It was all, you know, yellow me on my own. So, you know, go to Canisius, set up outside the dining hall for, you know, Saturday afternoon. I'm not going to do it right Saturday now, morning. Why, what's up? No one's going to be out. you got to know your audience. As Steve said, go set up outside the engineering building at UB. See what you get. You might, you know, you might get some bites, you might not. Regardless, it's a good excuse to get away from the house and play radio for a couple hours. Oh, and the other thing is, as a club, if, you know, say a couple of us wanted to get together who do like more of the emergency response stuff, I know Canisius, I know some of these other places actually have clubs that are like emergency response related clubs. At Canisius we have the Red Cross Club. And every club president or program coordinator has the same dilemma of what they're going to schedule for the next month's meeting. There's no reason why, you know, we don't say, all right, we can bring a couple radios or whatever and talk about emergency communications or whatever we want. So what you don't want to do when you're trying to teach and recruit people, whether it's youth or older people, is you don't want to be boring. If you want to be boring, you can listen to 415. Um, assume your audience knows very, uh, very little about what you're talking about, but don't make them feel like they're stupid, because no one likes to feel like they're stupid, even if they are. Um, know your audience. That's a big thing, you know. If you're gonna be taught, I was at a youth night in Virginia, and there was an old crotchety guy, about, I don't know, maybe 80, who was at this thing, 
And he was yelling at an eight-year-old Cub Scout because the eight-year-old was not grasping the concept of circular polarization. And, you know, the kids started to cry. It was just like, all right, mister, just get out of here. You know, because you don't want those people around. Because, and especially when you're talking, I mean, if you're talking to a second or third year engineering student at UB and they don't grasp some of the more advanced electrical concepts, then they might be wanting to switch majors. But when you're talking to an eight-year-old, it's a different playing field. When you're talking to me, it's a different playing field. <laughs> so uh, don't, be talking about, don't be talking about technical stuff. Um, all right, so knowing your audience is key. Be prepared. You want to have a PowerPoint ready, you know, a, a poster or something ready. Another part of being prepared is you go to a lot of ham radio things and you see people that, uh, you know, maybe haven't showered in a while or have a long beard that hasn't been trimmed in a long time. Nothing's going to scare away a younger kid who's been raised with, you got to stay away from stranger danger and all that stuff, and their mothers. You see, you know, and mothers are, you know, will put the kibosh on ham radio real quick if they see some guys trying to teach their son that looks like they just got an Attica. It's not going to go over too well. Great. So, you know, have the right guard meet the right guard and the left guard. So, um, also, make sure the loose cannons and know it all stay at home. As I said with that older gentleman in Virginia, you know, a guy like that is not going to do you, do you or your club or anybody any service by being like He might know everything there is to know about whatever, but he's just going to be, if he's, you know, you know how those people are. And every club's got them, and it just goes with the flow. But when you're trying to show off to whoever, don't do it. I was at a club meeting for another club I belong to in the area, and the net director blew up at the membership for not checking into the net the week before, right in front of the town supervisor and the fire chief. It did not go over very well. And a lot of people did not renew their dues. So, you know, keep the loose cannons at home. You're trying to educate people. You're not trying to scare them away. That's the big thing. So the big thing was if you're working with people under 18, like for a radio merit badge class, or you have them over to your house to show them your stuff, like a neighbor kid, make sure there's somebody there. Boy Scouts emphasizes too deep leadership. That's two adults. Because those things always are he said, she said, or he said, he said. You know how that works. And, uh, and basically all i got to say is look at what happened in Penn State, and you, know, you don't want to deal with that. Um, BSA, Boy Scouts, offers youth protection training. I know the Catholic Diocese, Buffalo, offers Veritas training. If you're going to be working with youth, it's a good idea to take it. Like, as a club, we sponsored a radio merit badge class out of the clubhouse. Whoever was going to do it, it would be just a good idea. It's all online. You take it online. It's I mean, easy to take, too. I mean, if, you can, if you can read the material, you can pass the test with no problem. Right, and, and, and it goes beyond just not touching kids. It goes on to the signs of like addressing child abuse, and, you know. Um, well, the key thing I think I got out of that training was the two-man role. The two-man, yeah, that's You need to have two adults that are BSA Youth Safety Certified, and you're never alone with a kid, ever. And if you are alone with a kid, like you would have to leave the door open so that other people could see what you were doing. And that's just a general safety thing for you or whoever because as we all know those cases never get tried in court. It's a you know a trial in the court of public opinion, which might, you know, depending on how you look at it, it's fair or not. So um, you just want to be careful and it's too deep and also I mean it's not long, it takes forty five minutes online to just do the thing. So if we ever decide as a club, all right, we're gonna have you know jamboree on the air at the clubhouse or we're gonna have whatever. It's a good idea just to take it so you're covered. So in summation, you don't want to be weird when you're dealing with people that are interested in ham radio. Don't be weird. Be passionate and informative, but don't be weird. You know, people feed off positive energy, as we all know. So if you're going to be negative or be really boring and talk like this the whole time, your shots at getting anybody, whether they're a kid or an adult, into the hobby are very little. You can have the, you know, Kids these days' attitudes, if you're working a station and in between the rotations, you know, I can't believe that kid didn't get the concept or something, you can say it to the guy you're with, but when, they, when you're there, don't make the person or whoever feel stupid. And you got to understand that um, so it's working ham, selling something like ham radio is like selling tickets to an orchestra concert. It takes a, a special palate and appetite for it, and um, people aren't necessarily going to get into it right away especially younger people, because they had the problem with school and you know, starting a career, 
you know, I was trying to find someone to marry, raising kids, and all that kind of stuff. So life gets in the way sometimes. That's why when people say, well, ham radio is an old person hobby, I mean, generally the people that you hear that are active on the air, yeah, they're a little bit old, they're older than 40. But the other thing is, there's constantly people who are going to be taking their place once they get to the, have that time and the resources like money available. So next we're going to do a little team builder thing. Oh boy. So um, I have uh, just three requirements from the merit badge. Don, you want, can you turn the lights on please? Or whoever else. Um, um, and there are three easy requirements. And what we're going to do is um, Joe's decided to have a merit badge class. So um, I'm, I'm just hypothetical. Um, so what we're going to do is um, break up into three teams, and uh, not everybody needs to talk or anything. And then um, we'll, I got three different topics, which you can choose what team you want to be on. Please just don't go all to the same one. And uh, and then you know give about five uh, ten you know five ten minutes to prepare something. I have some uh, paper and some markers if you want to make a poster. And um, then you know talk for maybe five ten minutes as a group. So then we can be done by like eight thirty. So. All right. So um, I guess we'll make like the first uh, group go here. And then or actually we'll just go at the tables that are already there. So um, the first group will be explain the differences between handheld transceivers and base transceivers, explain the uses of mobile amateur radio transceivers and amateur radio repeaters. So if anybody is interested in that, or you don't want to move, I don't care. Um, find out. Can you pass it, Doctor? All right, find out about three career opportunities in radio. You want to pick one. Find out what kind of education or training and experience is required. Discuss. So just like pick three and say what they are. You need a master's degree or a license or whatever. Oh, no, I'm taking this next one. Oh, all right, take that. All right. And then the uh, last one, sketch a diagram showing how radio waves travel locally and around the world. Explain. Uh, broadcast, how broadcast stations, WWB and WWBH work. Explain the difference between DX and local. So, this is a little bit more time. So, I don't know if you guys want to, you guys can get up and move around if you want to do something that's a little bit better. And then I'll, we'll, I'll call everybody back to order at, uh, at 8.05. Uh,